I just look around and I wonder how many of us are all in. All in. He's it. He's our identity. He's who we are. He's the reason why we get up in the morning. He's the one that gives us breath, gives us purpose, gives us passion, gives us love that's not like the world has ever seen before. Good morning, everybody. For those of you that are new to the church, let me apologize and be clear. I'm not the regular pastor. Pastor Josh will be back next week. And um, you are in an extraordinary church. Um, and give yourself a round of applause celebrating nine years here at Legacy. So Pastor Josh is, um, he is, um, how do I put it into words? He is great. Um, you are in an extraordinary church. I'm being redundant here. Uh, I have been a follower of Christ for, I think 13 years, I got radically saved in 2009 at the age of 54. And I know you're thinking, that's weird, you don't even look 50. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I tell myself lies all the time, you know. But um, in my circles, I've met a lot of pastors, I've spoken to a lot of churches. Josh is absolutely anointed, you are in good hands here. So I pray for a long, sustaining, relationship in this church that God will feed you his word through Josh and others and I'm just grateful to be a small part of this morning let me just open in prayer father God we we want to submit to you uh, right now uh, I pray our hearts are calibrated to whatever it is that you would like to say whatever it is that you would like to convey through me please anoint this fool to share your truth, the truth, the only truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bless our brothers and sisters this morning. I pray this in the name above all names, in the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. So let me tell you a little bit about me. How many, how many have never heard me or don't know who I am? Okay, a handful of you. So I'll share a little bit about my background and then kind of get into the message. Um, I do want you to know that I am not a pastor. I was prompted to start KMG Ministries in 2014. I dug my heels in for three years and I said, not me. Uh, my father left me when I was a teen. Uh, I walked away from the Catholic Church when I was 15. Um, went out in the world, did a lot of things I've repented of. Became a New Age teacher in 87. I got radically saved in 09. So not a pastor, but I guess in a sense I am uh, a man that has a ministry. And let me talk for a moment about KMG because I didn't in the first service. The first service, they're all radically saved, not sinners at all. This group, you're all sinners. So I got to tell you a little bit about KMG. <laughs> that was meant as a joke, okay? Take it easy. So... And, and the women in the room, I want you to really hear me. This is really important because Satan is a liar. He twists things. We are so distracted right now and deceived as a culture, it's almost as if we can't even hear God's voice. And part of that is our own sin, our own unwillingness to maybe get a little uncomfortable and give up some of the, the ways in which we try to make it through the day. Um, that cell phone is something that um, is a tool, yes, but you wanna talk about a vehicle for the lies of the enemy, that, that square little thing is, is like a bomb in your hand, spiritually speaking. So I, I wanna communicate this to the women. We as men, we need your prayers. By the way, I'm a crier, so I'm, I'm okay. It's the Holy Spirit, it's not me. I'm not this, you know, guy that somehow weeps tears of insecurity and fear and, no, that's, that's not why I'm crying. Part of why I'm crying is as men, we don't have the courage to shed tears for what we've done to our kids. As a culture, We've been asleep on our watch. We've let things happen. 
because we have relegated our responsibility and our duty as men. So women, we need your prayers. We are knuckleheads. We are sinners. It's really quiet in here. It's gonna be okay. My messages tend to be a little intense. Just take a breath. Again, pastor will be back next week with a real strong word of God, but I, I can't share this enough. Um, in fact, let me tell you a little story that happened to me recently. I have a men's ministry. We have a conference coming up on October 21st. I even had somebody come up. This is what a, a horrible self-promoter I am. Somebody came up to me and said, hey, I loved your message, but I, I didn't get your name. I don't know your ministry. It's not like I said the website or anything else. By the way, I brought my book, Take It Free. I don't necessarily want a donation. You're welcome. It's my biography. I wrote it a number of years ago because I was a new age guru for 21 years. There are some of you that may know somebody that is still dabbling in the new age. If you don't know what the new age is, truth in all religions, it's all about love. The gospel is one of many books of truth and it is absolutely a lie from hell. And I taught it for 21 years, not knowing the level of deception I was under. So that being said, I have a heart for men, probably in part because my childhood was jacked up and I made a lot of really poor choices in my life before I got radically saved from myself. So one of the few spiritual gifts I know I have is, is I, I, I can hear the Lord. Sometimes he talks to me really undeniably, sometimes it's subtly. I wish I could tell you every time he talks to me, I say, yeah, I'm in. A lot of times I'm like, eh, it's a little too tough, not today. I'm a sinner and I need the cross every day indeed. So recently my truck, my beautiful Silverado that's now almost 10 years old, it's got 240 some odd thousand miles on it, uh, wouldn't start one night and I'm like, great, here we go. So I had to get it towed. I went down to the local rental car place and I walked in and there were two young women behind the counter in their 20s. Uh, I think one was a manager, one was an assistant. And I kind of said, I need a car. The one young woman in particular was very professional, was great, got my car, left, didn't think twice about it. I went to check on my truck at another location, same rental car agency, different location. I had to walk in and secure my vehicle for another day. I was on the phone with my, uh, my son. I have a 15-year-old son. Uh, I do need the Lord. Um, and I was talking to him, and one of the women behind the counter said, you should write a book. I was listening, sorry. And I'm like, well, actually, I did write a book. She goes, you did? I said, yeah. And I said, do you have faith? She said, yeah, I'm a Christian. So I said my name, franksontag.com. I said, go to my website anytime and you can see kind of what we do. And she like instantly went, she goes, oh, you have that book, I want the book. And I, I said, don't buy it, I'll, I'll bring it back. I, I, you do not need to financially bless me. And I left. Are y'all with me? It's awfully quiet in here. So a few days go by, my truck's ready. One morning I'm getting ready to go get it and the Lord said, tell, tell those young women that I love them, that they are my beloved daughters. I've never done that before. Men, you know, I, I, I get after it with guys. I never have said anything like that. So, okay, I walk into the one rental car place I had a book in my hand, and um, the girl that helped me, the young woman that helped me uh, before that, I said, I have something for you. And she's like, oh, wow, is this your book? Yeah, and I said, Ashlyn, I need to tell you something. I said, Father God loves you like his beloved daughter. And she said, what did you say? And I said, God the Father loves you as his beloved daughter, and she broke down, just wrecked, 
weeping uncontrollably. And my first impulse was, oh, I'm sorry, because I mean, it was packed, people waiting to get cars. She's just wrecked. The manager comes over to me and says, is everything okay? And I hear God say, tell her too. So I said, I just want to tell you that God loves you as his beloved daughter. Wrecked. It was quite a scene. And uh, I stayed a little bit and talked to them and, and, and gave them my card and said kind of what I do and left. And I'm driving to the second location and God says, tell them as well. And my first thought was, oh, this, this is going to be real interesting because whatever just happened wasn't me. And it was from Simi Valley to La Crescenta. So it was a bit of a drive, 30 minutes, and I prayed the whole time. I walk in, and the young woman that I had the interaction with a few days previously, I had my book in my hand, and she goes, oh, you brought your book. And I said, yeah. And I said, I want to tell you, God told me to tell you, he loves you as his beloved daughter. Wrecked. The manager is weeping. I didn't even talk to her. She said, can I hug you? Sure. She comes up and hugs me, walks away, and I grabbed her hand and I said, God loves you as his beloved daughter as well. She was wrecked. Why do I tell you that story? For a few reasons. Number one, you need to know if you deflect it, if it's hard to hear, If your heart just melts as a woman, God loves you as his beloved daughter. He loves you. He made you so uniquely and so beautiful in the the way in which God fashioned and created all of us. And, And it dawned on me, because I'm so locked into men, how much women are under attack in our culture that you're judged for maybe the way you look or a whole array of things. But I need to express that really clearly as I begin. God loves you as his beloved daughter. Now the guys, this is probably the one piece in the church that we're missing. Men. You know, the Bible talks a lot about When Jesus was baptized, the skies opened up. John the Baptist was there. Everybody heard God say, this is my son who I'm well pleased with. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice on the cross, bled, gave his life, died, resurrected on the third day. We know that. But the Bible talks about us as men. We are his beloved son too. And I can't tell you how many men in men's ministries just can't even get close to this reality. Mostly because maybe their broken relationship with their biological fathers, maybe because of bad choices in their life, maybe their walk with God is not really strong, but we are his sons and he loves us. And men really need to just spend time with that. There's actually a book called Sonship by a guy named James Jordan. It's phenomenal, it will change your life. Even if you're a woman too, it's not just necessarily about men. So I say all that to say this, we are his sons and daughters. We are here in a church that acknowledges that we love God and we're to love people. And I say amen and amen. And yet as the man who founded a men's ministry because God told me, what does that mean? What does it mean to love God? What does it mean to love other people? When the truth is, I think a lot of us struggle to love ourselves. Now, I don't mean a narcissistic kind of love. I don't mean kind of a self-obsessed kind of love. So let me share a little bit about my walk and how it resonates with me. Um, I was raised in Cleveland, Ohio. My dad got a job in the movie industry in the 60s, moved out here. Um, I I don't know what it is about L.A., The one thing I wanted to do was I wanted to go to the beach because in Cleveland, Lake Erie was dead and um, I just wanted to go see the ocean. So 
Talk about times of change in the 60s. I don't know where my parents were. We landed and I'm on a bus with my godfather's son going to Santa Monica Beach. Two 11-year-olds by themselves and we're just on the way to the beach. I get out, smell the salt air, and I saw a young little blonde girl walk by me and I thought, well, I don't know why they didn't have any blondes in Cleveland. They were all brunettes, but I'm thinking, I'm home. This is unbelievable. And I've had a love-hate relationship with Southern California for all those years. Part of the reason why I tell you that story is when we moved out here, uh, leaving my home was, was traumatic. My childhood friends, I'd never been on a plane. Shortly thereafter, my dad left the family, chose to divorce my mom. Um, I grew from five foot to six two in a year and a half of high school. I was always really short, thought I was gonna be a racehorse jockey. And then one summer, my first have it out moment with God, like, what are you doing? I'm, what are you doing? I'm, unless we race Clydesdales, I'm never gonna be a jockey, this sucks. Walked away from Catholicism, graduated in 72 from Notre Dame in the Valley, which was all boys at the time, and uh, went out in the world to try to find my way. Angry at my dad, angry at the world, angry at God. I was just a young guy that got into fights and the whole array of brokenness. In 1984, I purchased a motorcycle uh, in spring of 84, I was dating a woman. I knowingly knew she was married. I didn't care. I was not saved at the time. I'm not rationalizing or justifying my behavior. I'm just telling you just how broken and lost I was. A uh, One little incident, incidental that I, I knew, uh, she was married to a Los Angeles police officer. Real good choice. A lieutenant. Good choice, Frank. But I didn't care. So... We went one day to Hollywood Park. I loved racehorses. Hollywood Park is no longer there. That's where SoFi is now. But we went to go watch a horse in particular run called Light the Way Home. Big white horse. It's the name of my book. The whole story is in there. And um, in 84, there were no mandatory motorcycle helmet laws. I had a full head of long hair. Why would I wear a motorcycle helmet with hair, right? knucklehead. Um, we went and watched Light the Way Home Run, ran last, got back on my motorcycle, riding back to my apartment, descending the 405 freeway to the Ventura freeway where it meets. Straightaway Balboa off-ramp. Some of you know where I'm talking about. I look in my mirror to make a lane change. I saw a car barreling on us and I thought, this is it. I didn't wake up that Sunday morning, June 17th of 84, thinking it was going to be the last day of my life. Probably, venture to guess, everybody in this room, you didn't wake up this morning thinking this is going to be the last day of your lives. We don't think that way. With an addendum, unless you're dealing with a serious illness or some other things. But mostly, we're just on future mode. Planning our lives, planning this week. All of these things we're going to do Instead of understanding the truth is, and scripturally it's absolutely solid, this is the day the Lord has made. We don't know if there's going to be a tomorrow. We hear that, but we don't live that way. Or I'll just say, I don't, most of the time. I won't indict you, I'll indict myself. So I didn't wake up that morning thinking this was going to be it. I looked in my mirror, uh, on impact, the aftermath, California Highway Patrol said we were hit at 110 miles an hour. She was hurt very badly. Praise God, she survived. A lot happened from the crash I don't need to get into, but that was a wake-up call for me. Uh, in full disclosure, I did not run to the Lord, but I knew something was wrong, so in my own will, I said, I'm gonna get my life together. Well, I'm not plugging the book because I'm not selling the book. I'm giving it to you if you want. We wrote it mostly for not only the new age, but for what God can do in someone's life that surrenders to him, which I did in 2009. And um, I'll tell you that story and then give, give you a little bit of the heart of the message that I think the Lord wants me to convey to you. In 2009, 
25 years after my motorcycle crash, my best friend got radically saved. I was a new age teacher with a radio program. The LA Times, when we had newspapers, ran a front page article calling me a new age guru. I was all of that. I thought I had arrived. I thought I found my purpose and plan for my life to be spiritual but not religious, teacher of thousands of people, preaching love, new ages love, all paths lead to God, not necessarily just Christianity. And I was lost and deceived and didn't even realize it. Satan is such a liar. So in 2009, my best friend and his older brother, a pastor, invited me to play golf, had lunch, and they hammered me for two and a half hours. And I took it because I knew they loved me. For three years, they just came alongside me and loved on me. No harsh judgment. They watched me kind of be revered among people. And they decided it came a moment in time where they had to do what I call a Christian intervention. So they said, we've had enough. We got to jump in and get Frank saved. So for two and a half hours, they shared with me are you a sinner? Have you stolen? Have you lied? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm a yes, 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 yes. So at the end of two and a half hours, they're like, well, I think they had hoped I would say, I'm all in. And what came out of my mouth, because I was so self-willed, selfish, such a man in rebellion against God, I said, look, hey, I'm happy for you. Which in truth when Satan's got you by the throat, things come out of your mouth that are such blatant lies and you don't even really track it. I was so lost. I said to them, hey, if Christianity works for you, great, I'm happy for you, but I'm a spiritual teacher, blah, blah, blah. Truth was, I didn't want to bless them. My best friend had become a Christian. I didn't want to be like them. I thought Christianity was weakness. You need God, make it on your own. New Age teaches that we're all kind of our own gods in a matter of speaking. It's our culture now. In the 80s, we had buildings we went to where we worshiped Jesus. He's acknowledged in the New Age, but so is Buddha and Muhammad and all the other disciples and teachers and prophets. Jesus is relativized as just one of many. And I was full on involved in that as a leader. <laughs> so, Pastor Dale tells me Hey, Frank, if you don't make it home today like you shouldn't have 25 years ago, are you right with God? I'd been newly married to my soulmate. My son was a year and a half old. We had just bought a house. Life was good. I'm on the radio, blah, blah, blah. He said, if you don't make it home today like you shouldn't have made it home on that motorcycle, are you right with God? And I'm like, of course I am. But something pierced me deeply. And he said, would you meditate on that in your car? I sat in my car and I became very hot. And I heard a voice say, undeniably, are you ready to submit to me? Submission is an interesting word. It signifies authority. We have a world that is in full rebellion against God because we think we can be our own gods, which is such a lie of the enemy. Our plan and purpose is in submission to God and to honor him and glorify him with all the gifts he gives us. But he said to me, are you ready to submit to me? And I said, yes, it was undeniable. When your father speaks to you, intrinsically, we recognize his voice. And then he said, pick up your cross and follow me. Now, I know a lot of you are good Christians. You understand that's biblical and scripture, scriptural. Um, I had been newly saved for five weeks. I've been going to church. Bible comes. This is what a good, strong Christian man I was. Red letters. I opened one night, Luke 9, 23, and Jesus said, if anyone would deny himself, if anyone would follow me, deny himself, pick up his cross daily and follow me, I hit the ground. I'm like, I'm all in. Uh, it would be nice to romanticize the story and say, when I got saved, everything fell in place. Everybody loved me. Uh, there were some people that said, we want nothing to do with you. A lot of my new age followers, I remember one guy in particular called me Judas. 
a biblical reference from a new ager. Call me Judas like I betrayed them for following Christ. It's kind of interesting. So that was my new life. Um, God took everything away from me. I don't need to get into the, the weeds. It's in my book. Let's just say he ripped everything away by which I had to absolutely fall to my knees and be completely dependent on him. Sometimes God does that. Like the way to really get our attention, sometimes he takes stuff away. So in 09, I got radically saved. I started the radio program a few years later. That's a story in and of itself. Anyway, I did an afternoon program, Christian radio, for eight plus years. Been in radio 36 years. In 2021, I walked away from KKLA. Some of you listen to me. I believe God called me to do my men's ministry and to just seek him and get off the radio. So that's kind of a little bit of a context of me, whatever that means. But let me share this. Why are you here? How is your relationship with God? If someone was to ask you, are you Christian? What does that mean? Do you think Christianity is a religion versus a relationship? Both are actually true. But here's the truth as I know it. The church is in trouble. There are pastors in the pulpit. I'm not here to indict the church. They preach a good message. But I think part of what's missing is transparency. Like we're all broken. We're all a mess. Pastor Josh, I, I love this man like my son and a brother in Christ. If you come to Legacy at all, you'll hear some of his mess. He's not one to come up here with a perfect message and you're sitting there and going, he's awesome. I can never be like that. We're missing in the church to talk about, look, we're all broken. We need each other, but ultimately we need Christ. We need this. And in my early walk as a Christian, when I started KMG, what God revealed to me was, when you hear the name Jesus, have you had a radical encounter with him? I want to be careful here. I think some of us believe we have. I think some of us believe it's about reading the Bible and working hard and following him and doing the sacrifice. But I just question how many of us really have had a radical encounter with the risen Savior? Because if we have... And we understand that back in the days where he walked the earth, that he said, I have to leave in order for the helper to come. If you are saved, a follower of Jesus, been baptized, Holy Spirit resides in you. I look at the church and people that say they're followers of Christ, I, 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 I'm, I get a little concerned. When I was on the radio, when the lockdown started, I, I would try to really speak from a place of as Christians were not to be afraid. And yet I would get emails and phone calls from people that said they're Christian and they're like, I'm terrified. And then what did we do? Again, we collectively overgeneralization, but we pretty much went belly up and did anything the government told us to do. I'm not gonna get political. God forbid I got political in a church, right? That's another lie of the enemy. But I don't fear, I'm afraid, and oh my gosh, and, and, and I'm thinking, well, this book says he knows every hair on our heads. In my case, well, that's not a whole lot of work. <laughs> Talks about God's got every sparrow that falls. What, what, what are we doing? If we have the fire of the Holy Spirit in us, are we living fearlessly? Do people know not only who we are, but we stand out in culture? We're not supposed to look like everybody else in the way everybody else walks and acts and on our Instagram accounts 
and some of the things we're doing, I'm not here to chastise or rebuke you. I'm just saying this partly because it's online. We need to wake the heck up. We're, we're again, collective, overgeneralized we, but I think the church in some ways we're so obsessed with people that are non-believers and are sinners and we're quick to wag our finger and all the other stuff. And I'm like, we're the ones that need to fall to our knees and ask for repentance. We are a sinful lot. I lead the pack. I'm a sinful man. I need the Lord. I need the cross every day. And I'm under attack every day by the lies of the evil one. We don't take Satan seriously. We think somehow this is just all Christian candy land. God is good all the time, all the time God is good. It's all about loving people. We're not supposed to judge. If you had a best friend that was cheating on his wife or his husband, her, him, I would hope you intervene and not just say, oh, I'm not here to judge. But see, it's not us. It's the fire of the Holy Spirit in us. Do we even wake up and go, Holy Spirit, lead me today? We know it's not just us. The apostles that walked with Jesus after he was crucified, they, they scattered. They didn't have the Holy Spirit until the latter days before he left and he said, I have to leave for the helper to come. We've got such power. We know Jesus in name, but we don't know his power. You have such power, such authority as a follower of Christ by his blood, we are made clean and pure. We have the power to actually push back against the evil one, spiritual warfare. Pray violently against the lies of the evil one. But we're pretty pacified. And there's a lot of reason for that. Kind of a harsh message, Frank. Pastor Josh will be here next week. But here's the truth, and I'll be very transparent. I've spent a lot of years of my life being obsessed with me. My wants, my wishes, my desires, me, 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 me. When I became a follower of Christ in 09, I met a lot of people in, in, in the church and in the movement. God began to do a work in me, and I started looking around going, Where's Jesus in all of this? As the video portrayed, where is Jesus the warrior? Not just the somber, loving, compassionate Jesus that somehow is good with everybody. No, he's not. He talked about rebuking sin all the time. Probably the least read book in the Bible is the last book of Revelation. If you think Jesus is coming to give out free hugs when he comes again. That's not what the Bible says. So I don't want this message to be fear-filled or coercive or divisive. I'm just here to tell you, we got to get right with God. One of the messages that the Lord put on my heart driving over here, part of where Satan's got us is we're all carrying so much pain. So much real pain. Childhood, relationships broken up, lost loved ones, illness, the whole nine yards. This is a fallen world. Part of the pain we're supposed to use to surrender to Christ who's killed everything on the cross, give it to him, put it at the foot of the cross, deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and serve God as he's calling you to be served and serve him. The digitimer is winding down. I don't want to be too long. You know, we live in a day and age also in the church, and I'm not saying this is the church because this church is an exception. I actually turn churches down these days when they ask me to preach. Some of the big churches, you have 33 minutes. Don't talk about sin. People don't want to hear that. We want them to come back. Man, when I got saved in 09 and Jesus showed me what a filthy lion sinner I was, he saved me from myself. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is a warrior. 
He wants to fight for you in your life spiritually. You got to give your life to him. Not 50%, not 70%, not 80%. I just look around and I wonder how many of us are all in. All in. He's it. He's our identity. He's who we are. He's the reason why we get up in the morning. He's the one that gives us breath, gives us purpose, gives us passion, gives us love that's not like the world has ever seen before. And I get it. It comes at a cost. I mean, I get it. But goodness gracious, if you truly have had a radical encounter with Christ and the Holy Spirit dwells and lives within you, this is a quick breath before we're home with him for eternity. And while we're here, you cannot wait to get up in the morning and get after it. In his word, he gives you an appetite, a hunger. Where's the hunger in the church? You're all an exception. I know it's in here. But you should go out in the world. You should go in some of the churches. Heck, what about non-believers that'll never understand or hear who the warrior Jesus is? But let me start winding down and end as I began. Above all of this, you as women are his beloved daughter. You need to spend quiet time in that. Culture has wounded you so deeply, judged you about the way you look and all the other stuff. That's not the way God sees you. That's not the way he made you. That's not the way he loves you as his beloved daughter. And with respect, stop settling for knuckleheads. And guys, I believe in my heart of hearts that culture is the way it is because we have stepped away on our watch. We've walked away, we've tapped out. Too hard. We don't really understand biblical masculinity. Heck, I live in a time, I would have never thought gender would be under attack. I do men's events now and I get emails. You chauvinist, what, 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 women aren't allowed? I'm thinking, we've lost our way. Let me share a few thoughts that I wrote down last night and then we'll close in prayer. Y'all with me? Yes. Sophie Scholl was a 21-year-old young woman who was raised in Nazi Germany under the Third Reich. She was a young Christian girl. You women in the audience need to listen to this. Sophie Scholl had started to understand that there was something really bad going on in Germany. She started seeing pamphlets called the White Rose Resistance spread around mostly schools. She read it and it was all about how they need to resist the Nazis. She ended up finding out it was her brother and some other people, so she joined the White Rose Resistance. Sadly, one afternoon, I think it was the University of Berlin, um, she got caught spreading some of these pamphlets about Christ and resisting the Nazis. Her and her brother and others were arrested and they were beheaded. But this is what she said before they executed her. The real damage is done by those millions who want to survive. The honest men who just want to be left in peace. Those who don't want their little lives disturbed by anything bigger than themselves. Those with no sides and no causes. Those who won't take measure of their own strength for fear of antagonizing their own weakness. Those who don't want to make waves and, or enemies. Those for whom freedom, honor, truth, and principles are only literature. This is a 21-year-old woman. Those who live small, die small, 
It's the reductionist approach to life. If you keep it small, you'll keep it under control. If you don't make any noise, the boogeyman won't find you, but it's all an illusion because they die too. Those people who roll up their spirits into tiny little balls so as to be safe. Safe from what? You can only imagine if she lived in this day and age. This is in part the strength that we need to have as Christians. A fierce, a fighting spirit. What's happening to our culture? Do you not see what's going on? Of course they do, Frank. Of course I do, Frank. But the question is, do you believe this enemy's lies that says, well, not you. You have no place in somehow speaking out or attempting to change. God made us in his image. We all have a plan and purpose. And there's not one follower of Christ that will tolerate this kind of evil without trying to stop it or do something. Amen? We are witnessing the mocking of God's creation. We are witnessing the separation of mankind through fear, panic, and hype, and we're being conditioned how and what to think. Mainstream media is extremely manipulative, exploiting people's real pain and emotion that causes some to not even consider facts. If you watch the news, doggone it, stop it. You're not gonna be informed of anything other than the propaganda that's being pushed out and it's actually a lie and demonic. All about separation. I wanna be honor, honest and, and be reverent to the time, but I, I just, this is important. We're being lied to. The whole perpetuation of separation, racism, hatred, anger, the, the, it, these are lies from hell. Christian, don't forget who you are. We are not to live in a spirit of fear. There's a spirit of blindness, delusion, and deception in our culture. We need to pray that the scales are removed from people's eyes and that the church be the lighthouse to our ever-darkened world. We need to pray that the spirit of darkness be lifted. We need to pray as a church for that. And we have that power. The power is in prayer. You have such enormous power. What a, 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 an awesome, humble honor to be alive in this day and age. Yeah, in the middle of all the madness. God puts breath in you for a reason. For me, usually I miss it because I need to ask for forgiveness and get right with God. I pray maybe that's you today. If you need to get right with God, get right with God. I'm gonna close in prayer in a moment. But I wanna share this poem. It's truthful, and then I'll close in prayer. Some of you know who Carrie Job is, singer. Um, she has really blessed the Christian community in a lot of ways. A number of years ago, she did a particular song, and... Um, Halfway through it, a guy got on stage and recited a poem. And I want to read the poem to you and then I'll close in prayer. It's called, If There Are Words For Him Then I Don't Have Them. If there are words for him that I don't have them. You see, my brain has not yet reached a point where it could form a thought that could adequately describe the greatness of my God. And my lungs have not yet developed the ability to release a breath with enough agility to breathe out the greatness of his love. And my voice, my voice is so inhibited, restrained by human limits, it's hard to even send up a praise. You see, if there are words for him, then I don't have them. My God, his grace is remarkable. Mercies are innumerable. Strength is impenetrable. He's honorable, accountable, and favorable, unsearchable, yet knowable, indefinable, yet approachable indescribable yet personal. He is beyond comprehension, further than imagination, constant through generations, king of every nation. But if there are words for him, then I don't have them. You see, my words are few, and to try to capture the one true God using my vocabulary will never do, but I use words as an expression, an expression of worship to a savior, a savior who is both worthy and deserving of my praise, so I use words. Are you with me, church? Are you with me, church? 
My heart extols the Lord. Bless is his name forever. He's won my heart, captured my mind, and has bound them both together. He's defeated me in my rebellion, conquered me in my sin. He's welcomed me into his presence, completely invited me in. He's made himself the object of my sight, flooding me with mercies in the morning, drowning me with grace in the night. But if there are words for him that I don't have them, please, church, hear the following. But what I do have is good news. For our God knew that man-made words would never do. For words are just tools that we use to point to the truth. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, as the word, living proof. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created, giving nothingness formation. And by his word, he sustains in the power of his name. For he is before all things and over all things he reigns. Holy is his name. So praise him for his life. The way he persevered in strife, the humble son of God becoming the perfect sacrifice. Praise him for his death that he willingly stood in our place, that he lovingly endured the grave, that he battled our enemy and on the third day rose in victory. He's everything that was promised. Praise him as the risen king. Lift your voice and sing for one day he will return for us and we will finally be united with our savior for eternity. So it's not just words that I proclaim from my words point to the word. And the word has a name. Hope has a name. Joy has a name. Peace has a name. Love has a name. And that name is Jesus Christ. Praise his name forever. Father God, we come to you in closing. Lord, I just pray for everyone in this room that may be part of what we need is conviction. If anyone in this room, in their heart of hearts, feels a tug of conviction, maybe they ask for forgiveness to you right now. Father God, we don't want to walk out of this room without being right with you. I pray for every brother and sister in this room, every son and daughter that you love immensely and are well pleased with. I pray for them that they understand that there's no guarantee for tomorrow. This is the day you have made. Yes, we are to be joyous, but yes, we are to understand that we as Christians are to stand out against this world. I pray you breathe new life into them by the power of the Holy Spirit. Heal our broken hearts. There's so much pain in this room, Lord. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. Show us we are not alone. We rebuke the lies of the enemy by the blood of Jesus Christ. Shut your mouth. Lord, show us our path. Make our paths straight. And may we love fiercely and boldly and fearlessly, not only to the world, to each other, but to those of us that understand that we need to die to ourselves and follow you, Lord Jesus. I thank you for every man and woman in this room. I pray blessings over their life, healings over their life, joy over their life. You are the risen King, Lord. Have your way with us and speak to us and bless us in this day you have made. I pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. I love you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening.